Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. fellowship for five years. He has a degree in comparative religious studies and has been a Dharma practitioner for 40 years, first in the Vajrayana tradition and more recently in the Vipassana tradition. He is a graduate of the Spirit Rock Meditation Center's dedicated practitioners program and shares the Dharma at several sanghas in the Bay Area. And I can say that in the brief time I've gotten to know David, I always get a sense he's a man who loves the Dharma. So, David. I do love the Dharma. <laughs> I love you guys too. I love being here. Whether I'm sitting facing this way or facing that way, it's uh, it's always great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my topic for today, which I'm going to hold off telling you what it is for a minute or two. Um, was was uh, something that I just brought up in passing. I think the last time I talked here, and somebody came up to me and said, "Oh, let's make a Dharma talk out of that." Um, so I just kind of filed it away in the back of my head, and uh, in the last week or two, I thought, oh, "Okay, well, it's time to put together a Dharma talk," and, and it just kind of got away from me. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about some kind of big Buddhist concepts. So it's a little bit more of a tutorial than you usually hear coming from me um, in Dharma talks. Uh, but big Buddhist concepts, there's nothing wrong with uh, taking a look at them. I just want to pref preface this by saying that um, the Buddha himself was not big on big Buddhist concepts. Uh, the Buddha did not... Uh, did not like to address metaphysics, metaphysical concepts. In fact, he, he actively uh, discouraged people from bringing up metaphysical ideas. Uh, questions like, uh, what's the meaning of life? Is there a God? The Buddha just generally just wouldn't answer them, or he would change the subject. So uh, one of the interesting things, and one of the things that attracts me to, to uh, the Dharma is... Uh, this avoidance of big metaphysical concepts. The Buddha said, I, I, I teach only uh, uh, suffering and freedom from suffering, which is another way of saying I teach happiness. Nevertheless, in the course of his teaching, these big concepts came up, like the Four Noble Truths, Dukkha, Freedom, Dukkha, and 
and they kind of sometimes come across as being treated dogmatically, which the Buddha, was, if anything, was not dogmatic. The Buddha said, um, uh, whatever you hear coming from me, and I'm repeating this, whatever you hear coming from me, you should be able to check out in your own experience. And by that he meant um, not your views and opinions about things, but your, your own what you what you see in, in, in the world and what you see what happens when you meditate when you get quiet so um, I'm going to uh, use a few poly words poly is the, the language or a, a, an approximation of the language of the Buddha's time because some and I'll give you the translations but sometimes for me um, hearing a poly word reminds me that, that this concept might be bigger or different, or, or somehow somehow different than the English concept. And I'm also going to give you a couple of those notorious Buddhist lists. So, and I know they annoy some people. So because I'm talking a little bit about um, what I hope won't come across too much as concepts, is, I'd rather have them come across as practices. If it's not making any sense to you, or if you're not wrapping your mind around it, um, just let it go. See what bubbles up. Hopefully we'll have time to talk a little bit afterwards. So, uh, to start out, uh, one of the really big uh, collections of concepts, really, really important list in the Buddha's teaching, is the three characteristics of experience. Do you all know what the three characteristics of all experience are? They're in Pali, anicca, anatta, and dukkha. All experience is, all of our human experience, the world, is uh, uh, characterized by impermanence, by unsatisfactoriness, and thirdly, by non-self. So, um, that's a big starting off point for a lot of people that come to the Dharma um, trying to wrap their minds around Anicca, Nada, and Dukkha. And uh, it's, it's, it's not so easy. For me, the idea of impermanence was um, the easiest one because I, I see that in my life. Uh, people come and go. Uh, I look at the world around me. It changes. When I meditate, my, my thoughts are all over the place. My mind changes. My body changes. I get older. My fingernails grow. My hair falls out. Um, dukkha, or unsatisfactoriness, took me a little bit longer to get, but I also got that through practice. And for me, that's, that's um, largely understood through uh, my understanding of impermanence. Is if the world's impermanent, and if my mind's impermanent, if my experience is impermanent, then everything's changing, and that's unsettling. That's unsatisfactory. Even the good stuff, the wonderful things that happen to us in life are temporary. They, they end, and that's unsatisfactory. And the bad stuff, the, the stuff, the unpleasant stuff that happens in life, you know, just keeps happening. And that's unsatisfactory. So the third characteristic on that list is, is the one that doesn't get talked about so much in uh, in, in, in sagas and in the Dharma world, and that's anatta. That's this idea of non-self. And I spent the longest time trying to uh, understand that from an intellectual perspective and was essentially not successful. And it was only when I started to approach it through my practice, like I did with, with impermanence and, and with um, unsatisfactoriness, that it started to make sense. So um, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. And the way that I'm coming at it is, is not to try to define anatta or, or non-self for you, but to talk about how we self, how we make ourselves, how we, how we create ourselves on a minute-to-minute, day-to-day basis. So one of the ways we do this um, is through our view of ourselves, our opinion about ourselves. In Pali, that's called Sakaya Ditti, self-view. 
Sakai Adini or self view is, is basically the stories we tell about ourselves. They start very early in childhood and they get reinforced on a daily basis for the rest of our lives. Do you ever get tired of your story? Anybody? <laughs> just, do you ever find yourself telling your story sometimes and you just think, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And, then, and when it gets really disturbing, if this is a great practice, when you start realizing it's not true, or it's elaborated, or it's... And the Buddha um, said that often in his teaching. It's not true. <laughs> Words of the Buddha. Non-identification has been declared by the Blessed One. For whatever way one concedes, the fact is other than that. How do you think about yourself? It's probably other than that. So our stories aren't reality. They're a conceptual projection. They might be kind of true. They might be based in truth. They might have been, based, been true at one time, but not now. But given the fact that they started so early in our, in our, in our lives, they may not have even been your story. They may, they, they may have been something that somebody told you. Your parents, teacher... You're, 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 you're a slow learner, or you're a good athlete, or you're very good looking. These are all ideas that we, we pick up and, and, and attach to. So we get identified with these views and stories. And that's the problem. The problem isn't so much that we have stories and that we, we have ways of talking about ourselves. The problem is that we get identified or attached to our stories. I saw a bumper sticker at, uh, I, I was out of Spirit Rock for a retreat and somebody had a bumper sticker in their car that said, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> that Actually, that'd be a good title for this talk. Don't believe everything that you think. So with mindfulness practice, um, this is something we can really work on. In mindfulness practice, um, getting quiet, looking at what is going on with our mind, doing a certain amount of investigating, is a wonderful opportunity to start picking apart some of those stories. Just in the first place, listening to those stories. And then asking the question, is this true? Is this accurate? Is this me? The uh, Another poly word, Baba describes the way that we um, continue on a daily basis to elaborate our stories. Baba means becoming, and it's, it's how we how we are born, re reborn in our own minds every day. How we create ourselves. Um, it's a really interesting thing to look at in practice. Is is how we uh, how we how we define ourselves, how we become. I'll give you an example of it. As I, the last couple of days, I had kind of worked on this talk, and then I, was, then I started thinking about it. Like, oh, is this a good topic for this group? Am I qualified to talk about it? And do I really know what I'm talking about? And are they going to like it? And are they going to like me? And am I the right person to be doing this? That's that's all bava. That's all you know. I could have completely gotten bogged down and stressed out and overwhelmed by uh, my doubts about myself, about the topic, about whatever I was doing. Um, so my practice was, is just whenever that stuff came up, I would just let go of it. Just, just notice, okay, it arises, you let go. Kind of like what we do in meditation. Stuff arises, we let go. Hamid Ali says, defines ego as the psychic structure based on crystallized beliefs of who we are and what the world is. We have all these crystallized beliefs and they become our ego. They're, they're us. We think they're us. So, um, what is us if, if us is not our thoughts and our beliefs about ourselves? The Buddha had teachings about that too. And this is um, another one of those really famous lists. I'm going to 
run it through, run by it as quickly, quickly as quickly as I can. Um, the Buddha said that there are five functions that make up human beings. Being a human being is, is kind of a matter of five functions. We call them the, the the aggregates or the khandas. In, in um, Pali, it's called khandas, which means bundle or group. Um, the translation is aggregates. So here's what makes up a human being, according to the Buddha. Our body, my body, the solid thing, earth, air, fire, water, this body. Feeling tone, second one. Feeling tone isn't about emotions, it's, it's, it's our preferences. It's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And it, to practice with this, it's a really interesting thing to, to do in your practice, whether it's just walking around daily life or sitting on a cushion. Um, notice that whatever comes up, any thought you have, any feeling, any sensation, anything I'm saying right now, chances are you're either finding it pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. If it's neutral, you might not be noticing. The third aggregate is perception, and that's recognizing or, um, or, or naming things. Like I, I know that from previous experience to be a, a Buddha Rupa, a statue of the Buddha. I know who that is. Somebody that has never seen one before would not have that same perception, but that's my perception. Joseph Campbell, by the way, said of perception, once you name something, you stop knowing it. That's, that's, that's true of you, too. Once you name something, you stop knowing it. The fourth aggregate is uh, conceptions or mental formations, which is uh, another way of saying thinking, and including your emotions, thinking and feeling. Um, I am my thoughts. I have my thoughts, my thoughts are me. And the fifth is uh, consciousness, consciousness itself. Like, who is doing this noticing? Consciousness. So the, the aggregates are real. You, you can't deny we, we have bodies, and we have thoughts, and we have consciousness. So the, 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 the fact that we have, that these aggregates make, our, make us up is not the problem. The problem is that we get attached to them. This body is me. If this body changes, it's uh, it's no longer me. Therefore, it's it's disturbing. So we, we find it. We, our bodies age. That's that's a little scary. Disturbing. We our, our bodies are going to die eventually. That's that's very disturbing to us. Our thoughts change. Um, a lot of people find it very threatening to think about uh, that the, 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 the thoughts might not be accurate. So for all five of these khandas, we tend to say to ourselves, unconsciously, silently, I take my body to be myself. I take my thoughts to be myself. I take my consciousness to be my, myself, my thoughts, my perceptions. The Buddha taught that none of these can be taken as self. None of these khandas, which are real, cannot, no single one of them can be taken as self. So that's an exploration we can do in our practice. Is okay, is my body myself? This ever-changing thing is my body. What's essentially me? So clinging is the is which I know you've all heard other speakers talking about clinging. Clinging is the is the problem in, in this process. It's getting attached to our bodies, getting attached to our thoughts. Um, Sometimes this is easier to see in other people than it is in yourself. When somebody is, is spouting just you know really kind of inane views, or or somebody has an idea of themselves that you know is is not true. Someone that you know is, 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 is a pleasant, nice, attractive person that thinks they're just the worst person on earth, and you just want to shake them and say, "That's not my perception." <laughs> you know, you're, but we have these beliefs, so sometimes it's easier to see in other people than. Than, than in ourselves, which is why other people can 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 be our teachers. Because when I see people with uh, when, when my friends reflect things about themselves that I don't agree with, um, or that I have a different perception about, very often now I, I say, "Oh, I do that too." 
It's just a reminder, I do that too. And it's an opportunity for great compassion for both them and for myself. It's, oh, I do that too. And likewise, thinking is not the problem. Thoughts arise. Um, one of the things, one of the, the, the delusions that a lot of people have coming to meditation is that if they sit and close their eyes, their mind's going to go blank and, um, and they're not going to have any thoughts and it's going to be this very pleasant experience. Thoughts happen. <laughs> thoughts happen and they only become a problem when we attach to them in meditation. So that's our, our, our meditation practice, is allowing thoughts to happen, allowing feelings, sensations to happen without attaching, without attaching. And it takes practice, because we are so conditioned to attach. Thoughts are only a problem when we take them as being the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And having just come through a political season, you have heard a lot of people that thought they had the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, another example about myself and, and this whole process of, of, of solving, of <coughs> creating identity or having identity, was uh, about five years ago. Five, uh, five years ago, my partner died, and I'd been in a relationship for uh, over 12 years, and we were best friends and really close. And my identity was completely wrapped up in this relationship, more so than I knew. And at the time my partner died, um, I was just overwhelmed with grief. And because of that, I quit my job, and I gave myself at the time, what the plan was, it was, was going to give myself a sabbatical of a couple of years, and um, just kind of reevaluate where I am in the world, rethink things. I ended up retiring, but the idea was a sabbatical. Well, I was really quite shocked after a while and surprised uh, to learn that how much my identity was wrapped up in A, being in a relationship that was well-defined and, and a habit, and B, having a, a job and a profession. I knew what to say when people said, asked, what do you do? You know, I had an answer, an easy answer, an easy answer about, oh, are, are you with somebody? Are you in a relationship? And all of a sudden, I didn't have a relationship, and I didn't have a job, and I didn't know how to define myself. It was very disconcerting, very disconcerting. Um, eventually, when I could let go of, of, of the need to, to have those identities, um, it was really liberating for me. Um, but it, that wasn't an easy process. I kind of learned it the hard way. So. Imagine that um, many of you have attachments to identities, not your fault. We do it habitually. Have, have, have attachments to ident identities that you just kind of take for granted. You might not be too aware of. Your job, your relationship, your, your interests, your um, intelligence, your hobbies, your families sometimes cling to these identities feels like what's holding us together. Like, I am this. I have a definition. So there's a, a, a third part of this identity um, view business that the Buddha thought about, and that's another Pali word, another Pali concept. It's called mana, which is conceit. Conceit is um, the root of conceited in English. Conceit is about um, I am. Often conceit is about comparison. I'm better than him. I'm worse than her. Um, I'm not a good meditator. During the meditation, everybody in the room is so quiet and still, and my mind is just going 
10,000 miles a minute and I'm not as good as everybody else who's sitting here being perfect Buddhas. We feel conceit about our age, our race, our sexual identity, our religion, our nationality, our status, our class, even our spirituality. So conceit is actually uh, the cause of some of our worst problems in the world. <coughs> my country's better than yours. My religion is superior to yours. Conceit also works the other way. The other flip side of conceit is I'm not as good as. I'm, I'm, I'm inferior. I'm not as smart as. <coughs> One of the interesting things uh, I find is a long-term practitioner about conceit is that it's said in the in the scriptures and the suttas that conceit is it, as we start letting go of fetters fetters are obstacles to enlightenment obstacles to awakening and uh, the Buddha taught that, that some obstacles are fairly easy to let go of and overcome and, and other obstacles are the last to go conceit is one of the last to go it's one of the things that's hardest to let go of, is this comparison mind. So, personality and self are, are really just habits of mind that we reinforce through repetition. It's, it's the way the mind inclines in habitual ways. It's habit. Our personality is a habit. R.D. Lang says... The range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice. And William James says, Each of us literally chooses, by his way of attending to things, what sort of universe he shall appear to himself to inhabit. i repeat that one. Each of us li literally chooses, by his way of attending to things, what sort of universe he shall appear to himself to inhabit. I love that turn of phrase, appear to himself. Well, it's delusion. So our mindfulness practice can poke holes in this delusion. Our mindfulness practice can show us, can, can question authority. It's another good bumper sticker, question authority. Question your own authority. Awareness shines a light on these habits of personality. We practice letting go of concepts of who we are supposed to be and opening ourselves to a living reality of our experience. And that's what we try to do in meditation, is, is pay attention to direct experience. What is actually happening? Using our five senses plus thought. In, in, in Dharma practice, there's, there's six senses. The Buddha has a refrain that comes up over and over again in the suttas that is pertinent to this. This is the Buddha's refrain. It's, it's repeated very often. Seen as it actually is with proper wisdom, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. So we can apply that to any of those aggregates or thinking. This is not mine. Our body, this is not myself. Our preferences, like this or don't like that, this is not me. It's a practice. When identity view starts to break up, um, which it does, if we do this investigative practice, it can be disconcerting, as it was for me. Um, but then, as it was for me, it can be liberating. And we've spent our whole life building this, this, this definition ourselves, this, this personality, this self-view, letting go of it's not so easy. But when we do, there's a spaciousness and an opening and a freedom to it. It's, it's an awakening experience. And I'm not saying it's enlightenment. It's an awakening experience. And any of us can have an Some of you have had awakening experiences this morning. Just sitting and letting your mind rest can be an awakening experience. The aggregates are still there. Thinking, body, 
<clears throat> perceptions, they're still there. We just stop clinging to them. We start to let go of clinging to them. We stop empowering our habits. This is a good time for metta, compassion, kindness for ourselves and for everybody else that's doing this because we all do it. Sharda Rogel says, as the force of identification gets weaker, the eye is not so demanding. We begin to smell the perfume of selflessness. Anatta, non-self, concept we started out with. And Rumi says, if you could get rid of yourself just once, the secret of secrets would open to you. The face of the unknown, hidden beyond the universe, would appear on the mirror of your perception. If you could get rid of yourself just once. So, um, that's all I have to say. Just encourage you to try practicing. Try practicing with some of this. Uh, rather than thinking about it. Notice what happens when you when you meditate. So thank you for your attention. And um, part of this talk I was really looking forward to is opening it up and hearing what you have to say. Either in response to some of that or uh, or whatever. So I, I wanted to raise a question about one of the things you touched on a bit, um, and that's about doubt as one of the hindrances. And it doesn't seem that way to me at all. So it seems to me, on the contrary, that doubt is the very foundation of the practice. Doubt of the existence of the self, and doubt of the non-existence of the self. Uh, doubt of Judeo-Christianity and doubt of Buddhism. Even for some of us, doubt perhaps that Republicans and to say nothing of Rush Limbaugh are always evil and wrong. Uh, and it seems to me that on the contrary, that most of the suffering that's been created in the world has been created by true believers in various Certainties, and, and so I've, I've always been bothered by that. That hindrance, doubt is a hindrance, and I wondered if you had a comment on that. And thank you very much for what you had to say. I thought it was very helpful. Sure, sure. Well, there's there's different kind of doubt, and and I agree with you. And I think actually that the Buddha agreed with you. The Buddha made a, a a big point of saying, "Don't accept what people tell you. Check it out for yourself." Um, in his, his sermon to the to the Kalamas, that was, is, is one of those his best known sermons. Was all about that is you know, question question authority. So um, there's investigation and there's um, questioning the the, the 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 truth of things. Doesn't necessarily need about be, need to be about doubt for me. That's that's investigation. It's, you know. Is check out, you know, what's real and what's not. Doubt um, as a as a hindrance for me is more about: Do I have the ability to make these choices? Do I am I smart enough? Am I wise enough? Um, is, is my is my um, it's, it's a self questioning kind of doubt? Because um, I think everybody has the ability to 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 do um, investigation. To make wise choices and to um, cultivate um, right thought, uh, but if we if we question ourselves, um, then it all fall, falls apart. We don't trust ourselves. So for me, there's different there's different levels of, of, of doubt. Does that help at all? Yeah, I think so. There's actually a word that I'm looking for here, and and neurosis. <laughs> no, but that's neurosis. Thank, that's not the word I was looking for. But neurosis is that kind of doubt that that leads us astray. Yeah. Good point. I think yes. Skepticism is different than doubt. 
I'm sorry? Skepticism about like ideology. Is it is it different Yeah, and that's a good way of putting it too. There's nothing wrong with being skeptical. Um, so one of the things a lot of people admire about Buddhism and the Buddha is that the Buddha <clears throat> encouraged that kind of skepticism. But but the Buddha also encouraged faith, which you don't hear talked about a lot in Buddhism. But faith is 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 for me it's about faith in my practice. Like I have seen my own practice bring the truth to me, I have a certain amount of faith that if I sit with this, that I will come to a right understanding. Yes? I have two things. One is um, a line from a movie, and I've forgotten everything about the movie except the line, the fanatic always has a secret doubt. There's something in the movie, and I've put that down. Yeah. But the other is, you, uh, when you talk about expansiveness, uh, and I've experienced that, and I, and I I don't know whether it's from coming here or not, but in my photography, I, I, I've become incredibly expansive about what I let in. It's, it's almost this unfiltered view of the world photographically. And I tell people this. I said there is really beauty everywhere if you're open to looking at it. And my photography has changed because of that, actually. So I really appreciate that, what I've come away with from here. Yeah, you're, uh, you just reminded me, um, I just made one of those synaptic connections, you reminded me of something a teacher of mine said once, um, uh, in a group uh, in, in, during a retreat, and somebody was complaining about not, not finding love in their life, and, and um, the teacher said, you can find love in a puddle of dirty water if you know how to look for it. <laughs> and, and we have this idea of, of what love is, and you know, it's... it's, it's it's an identification. Yes, Ray. Um, the, uh, I appreciated the um, thing about my perception may be erroneous. Um, and I think one of the real impediments for me is just to, when I, even when I see that my perception is erroneous, to admit it. Yeah. I, get, I cling to you know, my yeah. idea. Yeah. How else are we going to change if yeah. we don't? And I'm reminded of a quote, it's either Plato or Socrates said, uh, time will alter and even reverse many of your presently held opinions. Good Dharma. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a neophyte in understanding Buddhism. Um, so my question had to do about your kind of elaboration of clinging. And in terms of like, <coughs> word, what one might call one's identity, rather, because um, I was thinking you were talking about having an identity or have, and thinking of yourself as being part of a couple, for example, or having a certain career. And I guess the question is, for me, I guess part of it is, is that necessarily a bad thing? I mean, it is, I suppose, if it's all encompassing and you don't think about it at all. But what if you choose it? I mean, in other words, is there a distinction between clinginess and choosing? So I choose to be in a relationship, or I choose to have a certain career or an identity as a teacher, for example, yeah. or whatever it is yeah. that I, yeah. I do. And, and, and I have one other request, because you, you provided a wonderful array of a lot of ideas. Before you finally end, could you just go over you know, like the BBC, the main points? I'll try. <laughs> but, but thank you to your first point. I really appreciate that because um, you're reminding me that I meant to say there's nothing wrong with personality. We need a personality to get by in life. You know, we, need, we, we, need, we need our identifications to get by in life. Um, they're, they're, they're necessary to, to keep us in the world. So I, I don't mean to say let's all work on getting rid of our personalities. <laughs> just, you know, I don't think that could happen anyway. But more about just notice um, notice how attached we are mm -hmm. to our to our identities and to our personalities, and just take an interest in that without even necessarily changing anything. Mm -hmm. Just just take an interest in it. <coughs> so no, we, we we can't do we can't do without that that stuff. Um, and I'll try to come back to your second point um, when we're getting close to done with questions. One of the things you thought about the satisfactoriness or the unsatisfactoriness, and you mentioned it as a sense of uh, things ending. 
But one thing I've been noticing a lot lately is what about when something seems just amazing and perf perfect and wonderful, that there's something that, like if I stay with it another day, whether it's the idea of a certain person or a relationship or an experience, I start also noticing the unsatisfactoriness of that amazing thing. It hasn't changed, it's just that maybe some of the chemistry has changed and I'm like looking at it more. Yeah. And at the very practical level, if I start using that as a th thing to tell me, oh, move away from that, it's not perfect, therefore, or look, you can let go of this because you see it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. I have a little concern that it might lead to letting go of all things and not appreciating them. And I, I think often that how dissatisfactory in experiences has to do with more my denominator of my experience. If I've been like stuck at a bus stop for three hours and then have a random conversation with a person, it might be feel like this breath of light or, oh, thank God. But yeah. if I'm doing too many wonderful things, there's more dissatisfaction notice in all these wonderful things. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's beautiful mindfulness. Um, there is too much of a good thing. There is such thing as too much of a good thing. You know, chocolate ice cream is great. A, a, a quart of chocolate ice cream is a little bit too great. <laughs> You had spoken about conceit, conceit, how we will just compare all our um, matrix of attributes to various positions. And obviously that's something that we ourselves should move away from. But how do we navigate society where the people around us and society as a whole has their own framework of conceits? I mean, is that just something to acknowledge, be mindful and acknowledge of as is, or by having an aversion to it is that introducing ourselves to suffering because we, it's just the fact that this is how it is, but now we're uncomfortable with the way that it is. That, yeah, that, that's lovely. Um, and, and that's what I do. Is when I have an aversion to other people's conceits or other people's um, thinking or, or views or attitudes, uh, it causes suffering for me. So we can't change other people. You know, the best the best thing we could do is mirror um, uh, mirror an attitude of of, um, of of tolerance and of um, not expounding our, our, our views and opinions um, too loudly. I didn't bring it up with this talk, but it, it fits in with with these concepts. That the the Buddha um, did not have a the the, the Buddha encouraged people to steer away from views and opinions mm -hmm. of all sorts. Um, not that we can't be discriminating and make, make the right choices, but um, you know, the world is so full of views and opinions, and we notice that, you know, like during the political campaign. I was just overwhelmed with obnoxious views and opinions, including coming from people that I completely agree with. Um, mm -hmm. So, But the, the other thing I, I want to go back to is what I was saying earlier on, is those people meaning all of us, can be a teacher. You know, they, they, they remind me that, oh, I do that too. I do that too. Yeah. I appreciate you delving into a very um, difficult concept in the midst of uh, here, because it's something I really appreciate about the self. I, I do a lot of investigation about self, non-self, interconnected self. And in the last few years, it's been demonstrated in my name. And people who know me know that I struggled with, I was Lenny for years, and then I said I better embrace Leonard, and then it was like, I did Lenny and Leonardo. And, and right now I say Len, and I'm not even attached to it. I just say it for, to give people something to say to me, you know, to have, have some recognition, but none of them feel like anything anymore. And I don't really care what anybody calls me. It's like whatever rolls off your tongue. And, <laughs> and that's, part of how I've been feeling this detaching from identity, because those names had a lot of power and identities. Yeah. And, and now I was like, the, the, the more I go into that place, the more is I don't really care what you call me. Yeah. I don't really, n none of them really fit anymore. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Don't you love that Joseph Campbell quote? <clears throat> yes. Thank you for saying that. If I can. Please say it. Please <laughs> see how I get it. Every time you name something, you stop. Every time you name something, you stop knowing it. You stop knowing it.
I don't know. I can't find it. But you guys just did it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why do you think gay men have so many opinions? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't... <laughs> Okay. I, I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> you just took us there. <laughs> this is, this, what's the name of this group? This is the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. What's it mean to be Buddhist? Do you have to meditate? Do you, do you have to name yourself a Buddhist? Do you have to take on that identity? What's it mean to be a Buddhist? What's it mean to be gay? Um, Gorbidal, yeah. Gore Vidal did, 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 rejected being called gay. And he said, homosexual is something I do with my body. He says, therefore, I'm a non-practicing homosexual. It's, you know, those are both identities. And uh, it's, it's, you can take any one of these facets of our, of our identities, our, our gayness, our Buddhistness, or not, um, and, and investigate it, and it's interesting. It's interesting to pick that apart. <coughs> Why gay men have so many opinions, I don't know. Except, you know, we've. The, the other thing I was going to say about being gay is we know about letting go of an identity. We're all raised to have an expected identity, right? You better be straight, and you better be good, and you better, you know, do what mom and dad, you know, follow the family tradition. And so, so we know something about letting go of identity. But we also know something about taking on a new, a new identity. And we have all that good taste. <laughs> <laughs> and we have good taste. Well, I'm good at you, though. all may have said that he wasn't gay, but there's no one who was more gay. He's, he's one of my heroes. And I just, I actually love being single and, 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 and not sexually active. I just love the idea of thinking of myself as a non-practicing homosexual. <laughs> I don't very often you have the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I was asked to summarize, and, and um, now I don't know if I can. Uh, but I started out with talking about um, the three characteristics of existence of our experience are, are, are Nietzsche, Nada, and Dukkha, the impermanence and unsatisfactoriness and non-self. And I'm just suggesting that the way to approach this concept of non-self is to think about how we self, how we, how we make ourselves, how we create ourselves, how we do that, that becoming business on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis, even while we're sitting here today. It's, that's, that's the practice that I'm suggesting. So it's just, it's just an approach. So that was really great. Thank you for all your input and sharing. Well, thank you. Uh, before we go into announcements, um, I'll make a point that the next Next week's speaker is Susan Moon, who a lot of you know because she's been here a number of times. Uh, she's a great writer and teacher, and a cast editor, and studied with Suzuki Roshi, and uh, is a great uh, presence. She's joining us next week. Uh, any other announcements? Jerry? Yeah. I have an announcement. No, sorry. I'm 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 sorry. i I um <laughs> I'm, I'm stuck without an identity right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. um welcome to our social hour, our half hour. Um there are some treats out there, there's some almond, you know, sweet roll and some zucchini bread and some apples with lime juice on them and um, there's
there's hot water, and I'll put a, a bowl of um, hot sensory water in the sink, so just put your used cup, um, if you've had tea, in that bowl. I'll be going around with the Donna Bowl. Um, suggested donation is five to a thousand dollars. We have many broad commitments. <laughs> And uh, frequently, um, or regularly, around 12.30, guys who uh, are able and want to go to lunch together are meet at the door and um, wander off to uh, a restaurant. And um, there's a sign-up sheet um, next to the Donna Bowl, or on that credential right here if you want to get on the email list. And I think that's it. And David, thank you again for another luminous talk. Okay, then, um, we'll close with the dedication of merit. And, uh, practice here this morning, you know, practice radiate out to affect people other than ourselves. May all people not be too attached to their identity. May all people have limitless personalities, be open to the possibilities of being something other than what they think they are. More. May all beings be well. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.